right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, my name is Caitlin, and I'm the education coordinator uh, for the Jacques Cousteau Reserve. Um, hope everybody is having a great summer so far and staying safe and healthy um, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have our first ever virtual creature feature session. So um, this is a little different for us than um, you know, hopefully uh, you guys have a, a good time, learn a little bit something each week, and we're trying to make them, you know, interactive and fun uh, virtually too for everybody. So um, we have uh, our guest speaker today, Amy. Uh, before I introduce her to everybody, though, um, we just wanted to go over a few things. Um, like I mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning, you are all muted when you enter the room. Um, if you have a question, you put a question in the chat box that's on the right hand side. Um, there also is a Q&A feature, but this gets a little confusing if um, we have people putting uh, their questions in the chat and in the Q&A. I can't sometimes see everybody's Q&A and it's a little funny to use. The chat box is just a little bit easier. So we're going to um, put questions in the chat. And we're going to answer all the questions at the very end. Uh, Amy has a couple of quizzes and fun things that she's going to do before we get to questions. But feel free if like something pops up in your brain that you want to ask while Amy is talking, you, you can put it in the chat. But we're just going to get it get to your question at the very end. All right. Um, and I think that's all the features I wanted to talk about right now. Um, and uh, also, your screen is not on as well. So um, you can just see your name on the side, and that's really about it. So, um, OK. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amy. Uh, Amy is our communications coordinator. Um, so she's in charge of a lot of our social media, our newsletter. Um, she's out during events, of course, you know, obviously not right now. Um, but she does all things communications. And she has a background in environmental education and I think is a horseshoe crab enthusiast. <laughs> um, so she is our speaker for today about all things horseshoe crabs. Uh, so thank you, Amy, again for doing this for us. This is great. Yeah, you're welcome, Caitlin. Hey, any chance I can talk about horseshoe crabs, like the better. So <laughs> I am so excited for this. <laughs> all right. Um, Hi. So I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you. Um, all right, hi guys. Um, just as Caitlin said, um, my name is Amy. I work with the JC Near. Um, and I, like she said, I am a horseshoe crab enthusiast. I love little guys. Um, I have been teaching about them for a few years now, and I just think they're adorable. <laughs> um, so we're gonna get started. So you see at the top it says horseshoe crabs living fossils in our waters. You might see living fossils and be like, wait a minute, what does that mean? I don't understand. Well, don't worry, we're actually gonna be talking about that in a moment. So we're actually gonna start with a little question. So how do you feel about horseshoe crabs? Um, this is gonna be the first time that we're gonna use the chat function that Caitlin talked about. So these little horseshoe crab guys here, if you need a little fresher, these are what these, these uh, little critters look like. How do we feel about them? Are we, are we think feeling good about them? We think they're cool or are we not so sure? Do you think they're a little creepy looking, a little gross? So give me either a smiley face or a frowny face in the chat so we can see right now how you guys feel about them. Okay, we got a smiley face so far, good. That's what I like to see. Oh, I got a smiley face too. I think I was it was sent privately. Oh, hey, that's all good. <laughs> I love the smiley faces. So it looks like we're feeling good about horseshoe crabs. That is fantastic. And I hope you feel even better by the end of this today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what are these little guys? Are they crabs? Are they not crabs? Let's talk about it. So they're actually not quite crabs. They're more closely related to spiders and scorpions. So the picture that you're looking at right here is what we call um, a taxonomic tree. And that is just 
when a um, animal evolves where the other species it evolves into. So it's kind of a little flow chart. So you can actually see, so this is where we have our horseshoe crab. And very close right next to it, you can see our spiders, our scorpions, and all the way over here is our crustaceans. And you can see that by our little lobster there. So they, uh, they do look very similar, just not as closely related. They all fall under what we call arthropods. And the way you can tell what an arthropod is, is it's called jointed limbs. So if you look at your, your arm, you have a joint at your elbow. And if you ever looked at a spider or a insect and you looked at their limbs, they've got these little joints all the way up and down. So that's when you can tell something is an arthropod. So horseshoe crabs are related to the crustaceans, the crabs that we know, but not quite as close as you may think. So next we're going to talk about where can I find them? Where can I find these little critters? Now, there's four species that we call extant. That might be a word that you haven't heard before. You probably have heard of extinct. So extinct means that the species is no longer around and extant means that it is still alive. So over here, over in the United States, North America, is the Atlantic horseshoe crab. That's what we're gonna mainly be talking about today. Um, but the other species do have a lot of similarities. Now, the scientific name, if you'd like to impress your friends, is called Limulus polyphemus. You'll sound really smart if you say that to your friends. <laughs> um, so that is the one species we're going to talk about mainly today. And that species we can actually find all the way up from Maine, the coast of Maine, all the way down and around to the Gulf of Mexico. So they have a really, really huge range. But their hot spot, the spot that thousands upon thousands come to every single year when they come and lay their eggs, is the Delaware Bay. So New Jersey is the hot spot for these little guys all the way up and down this huge range they have along the coast. Now, the other three species are located in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific along the coast of Asia. Um, if you look up images of those species, they look very similar. Sometimes the shapes are a little bit different, um, but they are very similar to the Atlantic horseshoe crab, which is this little guy right here. So we talk about a little bit what they are, where you can find them. Now we're going to talk a little bit about their history. So this image here is one of some of the first fossils that we found of horseshoe crabs. That was 450 million years ago during the Paleozoic era, very, very long time ago. And the reason I stress the 450 million years ago is because of the dinosaurs. Now, the dinosaurs were only around 200 million years ago, meaning that horseshoe crabs are 250 million years older than the dinosaurs. So horseshoe crabs have been around for a very, very long time. They're very tough, resilient little guys. Now, we all know that dinosaurs aren't walking around on the planet anymore. They are extinct. Now that extinction event, and it happened about 65, 66 million years ago, we call it the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction. That's the extinction that wiped out all of the dinosaurs and about half of the marine invertebrates on the earth and invertebrate meaning that they don't have a backbone. But even through all of that, the horseshoe crabs still survived. So they're they're pretty they're pretty strong. Now we're going to talk about the Cenozoic era. So that was from that extinction event, the Cretaceous tertiary extinction all the way till the present day. Now, so a lot of people name this the age of mammals, but this is also when other fauna, meaning animals, and flora, meaning plants, also flourished. So this is kind of when everything else bounced back. You see a lot of evolution happening, a lot of new species developing. And I do want to um, make a note that the most recent ice age, and I'm talking like the ice age from like the ice age movie, like that kind of ice age, the most recent one was 2.6 million years ago. So if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that long ago. And 
the horseshoe crab still survived <laughs> all of that he they still they still survive and they're still going strong so that's a little bit about them so let's talk about the anatomy because there's a lot of they look a little creepy um you might say they look like something out of an alien sci-fi movie so we're going to talk about it because looking at this i'm like i don't know there's a lot of spikes and it's looking kind of weird but we're going to talk about it so we're going to talk about their three body sections the first is this first section here this big section here and that is called their prosoma now their prosoma or their head region contains their brain, their heart, most of their internal organs, their eye, most of their eyes. Um, so it's very, very important. You can see this really hard shell on top. Now we did talk about how these guys are invertebrates. That means they don't have a spine. So they have this shell and it serves as an exoskeleton. So that's gonna protect them from predators. So we have our prosoma, this large section right here. The next one is this kind of back half portion, and that's called, and I'm going to mess this up because I'm every time, the opisosoma, or you can just call it abdomen. <laughs> I always mess up, mess up the pronunciation. It's a difficult word to pronounce, um, but this abdomen region here, we're going to talk about more what you can find in that region once we um, flip over and we talk about the underside and what you can see there. The third body section is this wand tail looking thing. Now it looks pretty scary. It looks like it might be really sharp, but there's no stingers on this. There's no stingers on their tail. We call their tail their talson. And there's no stingers. It's not very sharp. It can't hurt you. But it is very important to the horseshoe crab. One, because one of their main arteries, now arteries are what pumps blood through your body. One of their main arteries runs through their tail. So if their tail breaks for whatever reason, that can be very bad for the horseshoe crab. Now, one of the most well-known reasons why the Telson is so important to these guys is because they, when they come up onto the beaches, and we're going to talk more about that in a little bit, but when they come up onto the beaches, sometimes the waves can flip them over onto their backs. And it's almost like when you flip a turtle onto its back, they can't really get themselves back up. But the horseshoe crab has a leg up on turtles. This here is the hinge. And we're going to show you that in a little more detail in a little bit. This hinge actually looks like a book. It actually hinges. And it can hinge. They can use their talson to dig it into the sand and flip themselves back over. So it's very important because when they are upside down, they are, don't have that, that really hard exoskeleton, that really hard top shell. They don't have that. So they're they're a threat for predation for animals to come and um and eat them. And they're just they're not safe that way. So they have that telson in their hinge to be able to flip themselves and write themselves back over. So now we're gonna talk about what's on top. So we're gonna pull up here a good top view. So this is if I'm looking at a horseshoe crab right over the top. Now the carapace. The carapace is the name of the actual hard shell. We talked about the prosoma, which is the actual head region, which contains everything. And the carapace is the name of the sh hard shell that's right on top. And then we also talked about the hinge. This, that actually extends from here to here. That actually is what connects the head region and the abdomen region. So it's from this point all the way to this point. And like we talked about before, it hinges back and forth, kind of like how your knee hinges. It works the same way. Then you can see these little, little spines that are here. They do provide some protection. And there's also one very important um, use for these spines, which we will talk about in a little bit. But I did want to point out that they are there. These spines are also what they call movable spines. So they're not, they're not fixed. They actually can move a little bit. Now, another thing that I want to bring up is their eyes, because horseshoe crabs have nine eyes throughout their body and then additional um, sensors and photoreceptors. Now, the first two I like to point out are their lateral eyes. So those are, you can see them here, there are these two darker dots, and you can actually see them up here. 
Now those, when you look at a horseshoe crab, they do look like eyes. And yes, they are. Um, they are what we call compound eyes. So if you've ever looked at the, um, an up close image of the eye of a fly or any kind of an insect, it looks like there's these little hexagons all around the eye when you look at it. If you look at the eye of a horseshoe crab, it looks like the same thing. Now, these are actually very important. Um, they do help them see, but also humans have been using them um, for years to study the human eye. Before we knew much about our eyes, we actually um, studied the horseshoe crab eye. So you have the two lateral eyes. Those are kind of your two main eyes. Then they have the other eyes you can see at this bottom. You have your endoparietal and your median eyes up here in the front. And it actually looks like a nose. Um, if you first look at it, it might look like a nose, but they're actually eyes. Then you have little eyes behind the lateral eyes. There's ventral eyes that are underneath. And then there's a bunch of photoreceptors around the body and on the tail. These help to um, sense light and dark and kind of help them navigate through the world. Um, and the light and dark comes into handy, especially when they are breeding and spawning. And we will talk about that in a little bit. Now let's get to the fun, weird looking stuff underneath. There's a lot going on here. So we're just gonna start from the telson and kind of work our way back up. So we talked about the telson and it actually here is where it's like a ball, it's like a ball and socket joint. So how you can move your wrist, that their tail telson can actually move that same kind of a way. Now here, these little flaps, they're actually called their book gills. Now, the reason they're called book gills is because the gills are laid almost like pages of a book. They're kind of stacked on top of each other. Now, these gills can expand and fill with water, and they're very efficient at doing that. And, excuse me, I need to take a little sip of water. <clears throat> now, they're very, very efficient at holding water. And that's very important because, and we'll talk about this in a little while, but uh, horseshoe crabs come up onto the beach. They come up out of the water to lay their eggs. Now, sometimes they might get stranded on the beach. When the um, tide goes out, they might get stranded. But it's okay because they can stay up to two days out of the water with their book gills because they're going to hold on to the water that they can pull the oxygen from. So if they ever get stranded on the beach, it comes up, puts, uh, brings them back into the water, they're good to go. Now, they do have 10 sets of... Uh, they use their... Um, walking legs to walk and crawl around like you see on the beach. Now, if you look here at the very center, that's where their mouth is. Now, their mouth is not typically like you would kind of think with our mouth. The way they eat, they eat um, what we call benthic organisms. So benthic meaning along the seafloor. They'll actually crawl around. They'll take anything that they can find, whether it be alive, like a crustacean, a worm, or even like a dead fish. They kind of just take what they can get. And what they do is their legs are very muscular and they actually use those legs to kind of grind up and break apart their food. Then they do have a, what they call a nado base. It is a grinder. Kind of looks like these little hairs on their mouth when you look into their mouth. And they use their legs. Once they're done crushing it up, they guide it into their mouth. And you do have their chelicera, which are these two smaller, claws right here and imagine those being like hands with little forks so you crush up your food and you use little forks to scoop it into their mouths they're not necessarily clean eaters they're a little bit messy now we're going to talk a little bit about how can you tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab so how can i tell so there is a horseshoe crab right here and you can tell that that claw right up at the top looks a little different than the rest it almost looks like a boxing glove with kind of one claw at the top and a little nub at the bottom. Doesn't look like it can't really pinch just like the other pincers can. Now this horseshoe crab, you can tell that its first walking leg, it actually looks the same as the others. Now, if everybody can put in the chat, the top one, this one right here, do we think that that's a male or a female? What do we think? Okay, we've got mail. Okay. Give you guys another couple of seconds to log log your responses. Okay, we've got another mail. 
a couple seconds. Some all right. Matt said mail to Amy. Perfect, perfect. Well, you are all correct. We do have the male up here and the female at the bottom. So you, you, you probably know more than me about horseshoe crabs. I love it. So we do have the male up here and the female at the bottom. Now, these little boxing gloves shape. That is very important for when they are breeding, and we will talk about that in, um, in just a minute. So rem keep in mind this little boxing glove shape. Okay, so that's a little bit about all the different body parts. And now we're going to go into the circle of life. So we're going to talk about how they, how they go about their life and how long they live. And that's actually going to be the first thing we talk about. So how many years do we think horseshoe crabs live? It's actually longer than what you may think. They can actually live up to 20 years. Horseshoe crabs could go to college if they wanted to. So they do live um, for a very long time. We're gonna talk a little bit about how they go about their life. First, we gotta start at the very beginning. Now it's what we call spawning. And that actually does occur between May and June. So you can actually still see some now, even though it's a little bit later on in their breeding season. So what you see here is a female horseshoe crab and a male horseshoe crab. The females are typically about a third um, size larger than the males. It's an easy way to tell if you see a really, really big horseshoe crab, chances are it is a female. Now, you see the horse, the male horseshoe crab here is kind of like locked on to the back. Now, that's where those little boxing glove claws come. They're actually gonna take and they're gonna hold on to these movable spines that we talked about. They're gonna latch right on and they're just gonna piggyback. Now, what the reason that they do that is the female finds different spots to lay their clutches of eggs usually lay about four to five different little clutches, little clusters, um, each time they come up to spawn. Now, the male just kind of hangs on, waits for the female to find the spot, the female deposits her eggs, and then the she'll leave, and then the male will fertilize them. So he literally just takes and piggy piggybacks on for the ride until the female finds her spot. Now, how we talked about the Delaware Bay is one of the hot spots, or is probably the, the biggest hot spot for the Atlantic horseshoe crab. This is just one snapshot of horseshoe crab spawning. This is hundreds, hundreds, so many of these guys on this beach, and this is a picture taken from the um, of the Delaware Bay. Now, this is a little bit during daylight. It might have getting getting a little darker at this point. Um, most of the time, they do spawn at night they do come onto the beaches at night because they are less subject to predation and they're a little bit safer now like we talked about they lay these little clusters now this will happen multiple times throughout the season now their little eggs we're going to talk about what they look like in a minute um they one female just one female can lay up to eighty thousand eggs in one season alone now this is very important because typically only about maybe two to three out of that eighty thousand will survive to adulthood and that's for a few different reasons and we will talk about that in a moment so what do their eggs look like now this is the eggs in someone's palm so if you look at your you can actually kind of think about how small these little eggs are they're only a little bit larger than the head of a pen um or the ballpoint of a pen and as you can see, as they develop between this stage and when they hatch, they actually don't have their tail when they first hatch. As they develop, then they, they then grow their telson. And here's a picture of a little, little baby horseshoe crab. This one is actually, um, if you can tell it looks exactly the same as a adult. And we're gonna talk um, just a little bit about how they get from this small to the sizes that we see. Wrong way, my apologies. Okay, so this is what we call molting. Now, I like to compare molting to, if you've seen the SpongeBob episode with Mr. Krabs and he sheds his, his uh, outer shell and he's all wrinkly and soft underneath, that actually is something that happens in real life with our crustaceans and also our horseshoe crabs. So what is molting? So if you think about it, they, as they grow, 
they have this outer shell. That outer shell does not grow with them. Um, so at some point they get too big for the shell that. So what they'll do, just like how a snake sheds its skin, they'll actually shed or molt that outer shell. And that's what you can see here. So this is the horseshoe crab. This is the molt. So they're actually kind of scooting out of that molt. If you find these molts, they're incredibly interesting because it's just that outer skeleton. You can see the outer casings of legs, everything underneath. It's, it's incredible to see. So if you ever have a chance of finding one of these on the beach, it's a very unique experience. Um, so they'll do this about maybe 16 or 17 times throughout its life. So remember that small little one that we saw on the guy's and that um, gentleman's hand? That's a small one. And as they keep growing, they will molt multiple times throughout their lives until they get to the big sizes that we will see on the beaches. So it's a little bit about um, their life and about how they kind of go about living their life. Now let's talk about ecological importance. So how they are, um, how they are relied upon in the greater, the greater ecosystem. So we're gonna do another checkpoint. So have you ever seen this? And when I see this, I am pointing at these little guys. What are these things? So give me either a yes or a no. If you've ever seen a horseshoe crab, whether it be in real person or on a photo or a video that have, these little, it almost looks like rocks, but they're actual little little critters hitchhiking on there. So drop it in the chat. Okay, I have not, I have not. Okay. Give you guys another couple of seconds. Okay, so it's completely okay that you haven't seen these before. I'm glad I get to talk to you about it now. Um, so these little hitchhikers, they actually are little organisms. A lot of them are mud snails and other invertebrates that hitch a ride on the horseshoe crab's back. And they actually have what we call a symbiotic relationship with the horseshoe crab. So that's a beneficial relationship where both help out each other. Now, you can see the coloring on a horseshoe crab. It's very blended in with the sand and what the color of the sea floor or bay floor is going to look like. Now, these little hitchhikers actually help in their camouflage. It further helps them look like they are just blended in with the sea floor. So that's helping them with protection. Now, remember before how I talked about how these guys are kind of messy eaters? Well, as they're grinding up their food, they're going to kick up some of this organic bits. Think about it like crumbs. They're going to release some of these crumbs into the water. And these crumbs are exactly what these, these little guys will eat. Um, so they get food and horseshoe crab gets camouflage and protection. So that's that symbiotic or that mutual relationship. This horseshoe crab, actually, this photo is a photo that I took of a horseshoe crab. Um, it was in Ocean City about four or five years ago. Um, and as you can tell, this one's just doing fine. He was walking around. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what happens if you do see one on the beach that is in trouble. We will talk about that at the end. Now, besides having symbiotic relationships um, and having that kind of a role in the greater um, ecosystem, they're actually also called a keystone species. I didn't click, I don't know why I did that. There we go, keystone species. So what is a keystone species? And actually this is a great re representation of what that means. Now you can see the horseshoe crab and their eggs are at the very center. Now, all of these, organisms around this food web, they actually all rely on the horseshoe crab and their eggs. So they are an integral part, a crucial part of this marine food web. So it includes loggerhead turtles, fish like striped bass, diamondback terrapins, who we all know very well, we see them a lot around here, and then different kinds of shorebirds. So keystone, meaning that they are an integral part. If we did not have the horseshoe crab, if we lost this link in the food web, things might collapse. So we don't want that to happen. We want everything to stay in balance. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about, you see that sanderling. Sanderlings are um, a part of a group of shorebirds that one specifically that we'll talk about relies heavily on the horseshoe crab eggs. And it's the most popular one that you hear of. And that's called the Rufa Red Knot. 
So what is a roof red knot? That's a picture of the little red knot right there. They're really cute little little birds, little shore birds. Their body is probably about the size of um, your fist. You can see their pointed beak right here. It's great for poking and probbing into the sand. And then they have a little bit of longer legs to be able to wade through the shallow water. As you can see right here, they're digging their heads into the sand, into the water, and there's a horseshoe crab right here. Now, what they're actually going after is they're going after the horseshoe crab eggs. And this is very important. Now, the roof of red knot has a very, very long migration. Their migration goes from Mexico to kind of down the equator all the way up to the Arctic. So thousands upon thousands of miles. Now, they actually go along what's called the Atlantic Flyway. So they kind of go up and down the East Coast. And they'll actually time their migration every year to arrive around the Delaware Bay at the same time when this spawning or breeding season is taking place. Now you can see here, there are just in this small image, there are a ton of red knots. So these, these little red knots, these little birds can eat up to two times their body weight in eggs. That's just one. So you can imagine that a female has to lay that 80,000, that ridiculously large number of eggs just for the chance of a few of them surviving. Now, if it's very important that this migration is not only timed very well, but that there are enough resources, enough eggs for these red knots to eat, because if not, they might not survive the rest of their journey. They need to build up their fat reserves to be able to fly these great distances. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about helpful horseshoe crabs. So this is about how horseshoe crabs help humans. And this is a few ways. One of the most notable is the use in medicine. And you might be like, wait a minute, how it's a crab. How can we use that in medicine? Well, what you see right here is a horseshoe crab's blood. Now it's a very gorgeous teal blue color. Now we're going to talk about why it is blue. Now, if you think about human blood, if you look at your arm, if you look at your elbow, you see a vein, it looks kind of greenish, right? Well, what happens when you, if you accidentally cut yourself, your blood comes out red, right? So it's, it looks kind of green or blue in here, but then it comes red. And that's because of the iron in your blood. When it hits the oxygen in the air, that's what changes the color. So, Relating that back to the blue horseshoe crab blood, this is the blood when it's been exposed to oxygen. What, um, we don't have to put this in the chat, but just think about what kind of metal when it's exposed to oxygen turns blue. And I will give you a hint. The Statue of Liberty is made from this metal. So if you think about it, it's copper. And also, if you've ever seen a copper penny, um, it might have turned uh, oxidized a little bit, and you can see a little bit of blue on it. That's because of the copper. So they do have copper components in their blood, and that's what gives it their blue color. Now, another very important part that we want to talk about is what we call their amebocytes. That is actually a component in their blood that works just like white blood cells in humans. So if you think about it, the white blood cells in your body or what fight bacteria and viruses and anything that's not good that's happening in your body. Those white blood cells are going to fight that off and make you feel better again. So these amebocytes do the exact same thing in horseshoe crab blood. And we actually have a, I like to use the three letter acronym because the name is very long. So we call it LAL. Now it's actually called Limulus. Remember, we have Limulus polyphemus as the scientific name. So it's called Limulus amoebocyte lysate. Now, LAL is very important in testing of what we call intravenous medicines. So they're medicines that any shots you take, if say you're dehydrated, they will put um, an IV in you and punish you with some fluids. Anything that gets injected into the human body um, we want to make sure that it's pure before we actually use it on humans because we don't want it to actually cause humans to get sick or cause any additional problems. 
So that's where these amoebocytes come in. What we'll do is horseshoe crabs are collected. We take a little bit of their blood, kind of like when you go and you donate blood at a blood drive. It's called bleeding. And we will take some of their blood and then we'll actually inject the medicines into their blood. If we see any clotting or any weird stuff happening, any reactions happening, that means those amoebocytes, just like white blood cells, they're detecting something that's not pure. They're detecting something that's a bacteria, something in there that's not good. So we know if we see that reaction kind of happening, that we know that that batch of medicine is not pure. It is not safe to use on humans. So we'll take that back. We will do some more research. We will make sure that it is a pure um, solution. And then we will try it again until we don't see any reaction. And that means it's safe for human use. Now, sometimes if you've gone and given blood, um, you might feel a little bit woozy afterwards. They sometimes give you a juice, maybe a cookie or some crackers. Um, it's the same thing for horseshoe crabs. Um, they might feel a little woozy afterwards, a little weak, um, but we do release them back. And a high percentage of them do very well afterwards. It's kind of like you go and you give blood, you have some juice, you kind of recuperate a little bit and you're good to go. Now there is a very small um, percentage that don't make it, unfortunately. So we are doing more research to try to develop a product that works the same and move away from actually bleeding the crabs themselves. Um, but they're still so crucial and incredibly important for the development of medicines today. Now, some of the threats. Um, so what are the threats to the human horseshoe crab population? Now, the one up top is probably one of the largest by far, and it's habitat loss. You see this beautiful shore home right here, and then the beach, it's encroaching right on top of the beach. Now, development, such as houses and commercial areas by humans, causes habitat loss. And this habitat, these beaches are so important because this is where they laid their eggs. This is where their start to life, it, that's where everything begins and that's where everything is centered. So if they don't have enough habitat, they're not gonna be able to lay as many eggs. The population's gonna go down. So we wanna make sure that we um, try to mitigate that. We try to lessen the amount of development that we have and also help protect areas that we know are breeding grounds for them. Now, these two little critters at the bottom, I don't know why I did that. There we go. Um, so we're gonna do a little check mark. Reply in the chat what if you know what these two types of critters are. We have the one here in its shell, and then we have the one here. I'll give you a couple seconds just to see, uh, give you a little little test your brain and see if you know the names of either of these critters. Okay. Right, so we got conk, we got a whelk and an eel. You guys, guys, another few seconds just to log your thoughts. Okay, so we are 100% correct. This is an American eel, a juvenile, small American eel, but it is an American eel. Now, this is actually not a conk. They're very related. They're very closely related, but this is called a whelk. Um, a knobbed whelk specifically. And just a little fun fact, the knobbed whelk is the state shell of New Jersey. Now, the reason why I bring these up is they're another threat to horseshoe crab populations. Um, horseshoe crabs are harvested every year and used for bait for whelks as well as American eels. Now, we will talk about some of the protections that we have in place in a moment, but these are some of the biggest threats and habitat loss is by far the largest threat um, to horseshoe crab populations. So conservation. Um, there, there's a lot of legislation, a lot of laws in place that help to limit the harvest numbers that can be collected each year. And also, um, it's illegal to harvest females, um, to try to give them the best chance possible to replenish their numbers each breeding season. Now, you can see up top, this is actually from the Wetlands Institute that's down in Stone Harbor. They do a lot of work with um, horseshoe crabs. They actually, they're doing a survey. So they are surveying, um, this is some of them spawning. This will be used for spawning, um, surveying some populations. 
just so we can track um, how many there are, um, what's kind of happening so that we can track trends and see if populations are getting bigger, smaller, and then if they are getting smaller, how we can kind of help replenish their numbers. Another tactic that we use in research for conservation is this gentleman is actually putting a little tag on the horseshoe crab. Now this doesn't hurt them. It's just a little, like little plastic tag that gets um, attached to their shell. And if somebody actually pulls up a horseshoe crab that has this little tag in it, um, that actually, they will log that. They can report that they found the tag. And this helps us to also track their movements, um, which also helps in gathering data, knowing what's happening, where they're going, how many there are, so we can help to uh, replenish their numbers. Now, another, and I don't have an image of it, but there's a video I'm going to share with you later. Um, we actually worked, um, JC Near and Rutgers University worked with the Charles River Labs. Um, we're working with them for a jumpstart program. Jumpstart meaning, um, you see this a lot with terrapins around this area, um, with other animals that uh, we will take them and raise them in captivity from when they're eggs up until they are strong enough and big enough to release in the wild, giving them a higher chance of replenishing their numbers. All right, so we talked about a ton of information. So now we're gonna do quiz time. Let's see if we can test your skills. So this is something we're gonna use the chat box again, and we're gonna see how much you um, remember from just the wealth of information that we just gave you guys. So let's go with number one. How many million years ago did the four first horseshoe crabs walk the earth? So you can put it in the chat. See if you remember how many million years ago the first horseshoe crabs were found. Nice, we had 200 when dinosaurs first walked 450 million years ago. I'll give you guys another, another minute or so to log your answers. Okay, so the answer is 450 million years ago. So um, uh, dinosaurs were about 200 million years ago. So as we talked about before, horseshoe crabs are 250 million years older than dinosaurs. It's very crazy to think about, kind of hard to wrap your mind around because the oldest that we think of are dinosaurs. Um, but even long, long, many millions of years before that, we had the horseshoe crabs walking around the earth. And they're still around today. They've survived five mass extinctions up until now. And so they're just very resilient, very strong. They're cool, tough little critters. So very good. Let's go to question number two. What is the scientific name of the tail and can it hurt you? Just think about it for a minute, put your answers in the chat and we'll see, we'll see how you do. scientific name of the tail. Okay, it can't hurt you. All right. We're saying the name is called the Telson, okay. Maybe another couple of seconds to log your answers in the chat. Okay. So we did very well on that one. It is called the Telson, and no, it cannot sting you. Um, like we had said, there's no stingers on the tail, um, but it is very important not only to help them flip over, but because of that artery that runs through the Telson that provides um, necessary blood to their body. So we wanna um, make sure that we don't grab the tail. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But yep, you guys did great. It's called the Telson, and no, it cannot sting you. 
though it does look like a stingray's tail. So it can be a little bit, looks a little bit scary, but it's, it's completely safe. Let's go to question number three. Okay, so how many eggs total can be laid by a female in one season? So we talked about how the females, when they come up, they lay about four to five little clusters, little clutches of eggs, um, and they do this multiple times in a season. So do you remember what that large, large amount was that we had for the eggs that can be laid in one season by a female? Give you a couple of seconds to put in your guesses. <coughs> Pardon. Hey, I'm going to give you guys just a little bit more time. Okay, so. We got some good, we got some good guesses. Let's see what we got. As many as 80,000. Now, remember, we did talk about <clears throat> the reason why they had to lay this many eggs. The roof of red knot coming up on their migration that relies so heavily on these eggs. And it's not even just the one red knot that's eating two times its body weight, but it's also fish and turtles and other organisms that rely on this as a food source. So they have to lay this high amount of eggs in order to have that two to three to survive until adulthood. And that's why the <clears throat> conservation methods, such as the jumpstart program that I mentioned that we do, um, that, that can help um, increase the likelihood of these organisms, these um, critters surviving until adulthood. So very good, 80,000 is correct. All right, we got the last two. Let's see how we do. What is the name of the type of shorebird that needs horseshoe crab eggs to survive? This should be super simple, and I just mentioned it. We'll see if you were paying attention. Drop them in the chat. All right, so the Rufa red knot. Um, there are different types of red knots. Um, the Rufa red knot is the one that I did show, and that's the one that is the most um, popular type um, that specifically feeds on horseshoe crab eggs in the Delaware. Um, but the red knots are a part of um, a huge group of shorebirds, um, including sandpipers, and I, um, you might have heard of sandpipers. Um, so they're part of a huge group of shorebirds, but the roof of red knot specifically is the one that comes and makes that large journey and times it perfectly um, with the spawning season of the horseshoe crabs every year. Very good. All right, we've got one more. Let's see. This is a two-parter, and this one, the second part is a little, little, um, little more difficult. So what is present in horseshoe crab blood that gives it its blue color? And then part two, what is the three letter acronym for the part of the blood we use for medicine testing? Now, you don't have to put the whole name in there. If you do remember it, that's bonus brownie points, um, but it is a hard name to remember. So if you remember that three, those three letter acronym, let's see how we do. We can drop those in the chat. Another couple of seconds to log your answers. Okay, so we've got copper, just like we had talked about the Statue of Liberty or pennies, 
The copper, once it's exposed to oxygen, will oxidize and it'll actually turn a bluish greenish color. And that's what gives the um, horseshoe crab blood that blue tealish color when it's exposed to the air. And LAL, you guys did very good with this. Um, LAL was the limulus amoebocyte lysate. And um, the amoebocyte, though that LAL is what works just like the white blood cells to help fight off bacteria and other stuff in your body that would make you sick. Very, very good. Perfect. So you guys did very, very fantastic with the quiz. I know you were all paying attention, which is fantastic. All right. So I did mention that we were going to talk about this. So what do I do if I find one? Before we talk about that, we chat a lot about horseshoe crabs today. So we're going to bring you back up the same question that we talked about before. So how do you feel about them? Are you still, you're still good about them? You think they're really interesting? You're really cool? Or are you not so sure anymore? They may sound a little scary, not so sure how you feel about them. So drop a smiley face or a frowny face in the chat. Oh, I've got a lot of smiley faces coming in. That's what I like to see. Oh, thank you, Caitlin. Yay, horseshoe crabs. I 100% agree. Perfect. So that is so amazing to hear. These little critters are so near and dear to my heart. Um, they're just some of my favorites. Um, so we learned so much about them and you were all paying so much attention. And it was just, oh, I love it. I love it. I love horseshoe crab. I love talking about them. So let's talk about how to help one that is stranded. Um, I don't know if you've seen one that's stranded and we'll actually, let me open this up. So when it's stranded, you can actually see this one here up top that, and you actually see some short birds in the back. Um, you can see this one is on its back and it's, it's kind of struggling to move their hinge and their talcum to try to flip themselves over. If you do see um, a horseshoe crab that is struggling, it is 100% safe to go in and save them. All you have to do, um, you can actually see on this bottom photo here, this gentleman is actually taking his hand. It's just going to take and easily, gently flip them over. Um, another way you can do it is by gently grabbing the very sides of the, the carapace, that, um, that top shell, not grabbing the legs, not grabbing the tail and just flipping them over and putting them back. Once they're back on their legs and they're righted, they can just crawl right back into the water and they are good. If they are up to the point where it's really high up on the beach and you might not think the tide will come all the way in, you can move it a little closer, um, but a lot of times just flipping them back over nice and gently and letting them to go about their business is the safest way to help them. And remember, like we said, that Telson is not going to sting you, it's not going to hurt you but you do not want to grab it by any means grab their telson. Um, it is strong, but it, there are parts that are brittle. So you don't wanna grab it, you don't wanna, cause that can either dislocate it from its joint, it can break it, and we just, we don't want that to happen. We wanna give them the highest chance of survival as possible. So it's either taking and gently flipping it over or grabbing both sides of the carapace, that, that front, um, front top shell, and gently flipping them over. Um, I actually had an experience last year where I found a female, very large female horseshoe crab that got wedged between a few boulders and a jetty. I was actually able to take a few friends and we were able to um, use our feet to pry it against the rock, kind of push that out of the way and get the horseshoe crab out. Um, it's such an amazing feeling when you know that you've helped a horseshoe crab survive. Um, if you ever see one that's just um, walking around, hanging out, just like that picture that I had showed before, the one uh, that I snapped a photo of in Ocean City, they're usually fine. You can just, you can go up and take a picture, but there's no need to touch them. There's no need to pick them up and move them. Um, they're just kind of going about, going about their business. Um, so that's what you can do if you do find a stranded horseshoe crab. 
um, and you'll be able to save them and get them back to safety. Now, I didn't want to leave it just there because the fun does not end here. Um, I'm actually going to chat about each of these resources I provided and put some um, links inside the chat that you can explore further. Caitlin and myself will also send you a follow-up email that contain the links in case you um, don't have time to copy and paste them over into your browser. The first is a craft um, that is a build your own horseshoe crab. So I am going to grab that for you. It is a PDF link by the NJC Grant, which is a wonderful organization that we partner with frequently. I'm gonna drop that in the chat. And what that actually is, is um, it gives you some good background information, a lot of stuff that we already talked about. And what you actually can do, and I'm actually glancing over because I do have it on my other screen. Um, it provides pages that you, of the three of the body, the head, the prosoma, the abdomen, to which I will not repeat that word because I will mess it up again, the opistoma, definitely not, <laughs> and the tail or the telson. And you can actually put those together and make your own horseshoe crab. So that link will bring you to that link where you can print it out, um, learn some more about it, and go in and make your own horseshoe crab. Then we also have um, a video, and it's titled, What Does Horseshoe Crab Conservation Mean to You? Now, I did mention um, Rutgers University, our partnership with Charles River Labs. It actually, the video features um, a gentleman, uh, Thomas Grotus, who is um, one of the JC Near staff. We partner um, with Rutgers a lot in terms of research. And we worked with Charles River Labs on a jumpstart program that was helping to um, raise baby horseshoe crabs in captivity until they are strong enough to be released into the wild. So I did mention that earlier. If you want to learn more about that, you can. Um, watch the video. I'm going to drop that into the chat now. Perfect. Okay, so that'll bring you to the video. It's about eight, nine minutes long. Um, so that is that one. And then I actually have a few books. I'm not going to put um, links into them because you can just search them in a web browser because you can get them on Google Books, you can get them on Amazon. Um, you can probably get them on um, a Kindle as well, um, or the actual hard paper copies. First one is Horseshoe Crabs and Shorebirds, The Story of a Food Web. This is by Victoria Krenson. Um, this book actually goes into a little bit more about um, that link between horseshoe crabs and shorebirds, including the roof of red knot, and just um, an, a great story to share with um, with children and for you guys to read them. It's a very, very good book, kind of going into a little bit more detail. Um, then you have Crab Moon by Ruth Horowitz. And this is another wonderful um, story that helps depict the lives of horseshoe crabs. Um, and remember how we said that they come up onto the beaches mostly at night? Um, that's where they get the name Crab Moon. So that's kind of the inspiration for the title of this book. And then for any parents or guardians that are um, watching with us today, we have The Narrow Edge, Any Bird, An Ancient Crab, and An Epic Journey that is um, more geared toward adults. And it goes into um, more detail than I could um, provide in this session today. Um, goes into much more detail and you can learn so much more about horseshoe crabs because this was just barely brushing the surface. Um, so you can, um, parents, if you'd like, it's by Deborah Kramer. You can look up that book and learn mo uh, more about these amazing, resilient critters. So um, I didn't put those links in just because you can get them from multiple sellers. So if you just, um, I will include the names in the email. Um, so if you just copy and paste them into a web browser, they will provide multiple different avenues that you can pursue to get these books. It's a little bit about some extra fun you can have. And then I did want to say just thank you. You are crabulous. And thank you so much for joining um, Caitlin and myself today. Like I said, I love talking about horseshoe crabs. They have a special place in my heart. 
Um, and you all were fantastic. Um, you, I could tell you learned so much. Um, here is some of my information at the bottom, including my email. If you have any questions on either the resources I provided or on any um, anything either informational related or any events or any programs um, that could be coming up related to horseshoe crabs, feel free to shoot me an email and I can most certainly help you out. Um, and I can, will open it up now if anybody has any additional questions about horseshoe crabs. Um, you can drop those in the chat. Um, and Caitlin, did we have any questions as we were going? Um, I didn't see any questions. I just see the answers to, yeah, I have no, no questions so far, but um, you guys have a chance to ask now if you do have any other follow-up questions for Amy. I want to say, actually, if you guys real quick, above the chat feature, there's a little megaphone and a little drop down menu. Um, I want to give Amy a virtual applause. There's a little applause feature of clapping hands. So excellent job, Amy. You did awesome. That was so much fun. Um, learned a lot and um, loved the questions and quizzes throughout, too. That was really cool. Um, we do have one question. Um, is there or is there not a simulated version of LAL, so like a synthetic uh, copy? Okay, yes. So a few years ago, um, a lab started to develop a um, man-made version um, that does simulate LAL in the horseshoe crab blood. Um, it is something that's been developed. It's still in development as of now. Um, so it hasn't, it's not something that is being widely used yet. Um, but it is something that is in development, it is in the works, which is amazing for our horseshoe crab critters, even though we are so grateful that we can use their blood, but we want to make sure that we give them um, a good chance of replenishing their populations every year. So hopefully soon that will be something that is more widely um, distributed for use um, to further help, uh, further help our critters out. And it looks like, um, is there a good, is there an egg laying season? Um, so it's usually from like May to June, um, early May through like mid to late June is the typical spawning season. Um, that's where you can find, um, not even just along the Delaware Bay, that is the hot spot. Um, but anywhere typically along the bay, um, not usually Oceanside, just because they like areas that are more protected from waves. Um, so usually they'll go along back bays. Um, but if you, any time of that, you can even um, go out now and most likely see some. Um, that's usually when they go to lay their eggs. I've seen a couple um, uh, breeding in July, but that's kind of, that's a little bit later. Um, it is possible they typically don't go um, any later than that. So it's usually around May to June is when you're going to see most of the spawning take place. So thank you for your questions. Is there... Um, does anybody else have any questions? No question is a stupid question, believe me. <laughs> All right, let's do last call for questions. And if you if you think of one, like I said, if you think of one later, you can always shoot me an email um, and I'd be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something um, also I just wanted to mention, I mean, horseshoe crabs and LAL are particularly very uh, important. There's an article in the New York Times about how they talked about horseshoe crab uh, being a key part in um, coming up with a um, COVID-19 virus uh, vaccine. Um, so they're um, critical right now, um, very current um, information. And, you know, of course the LAL works so well um, that scientists are, you know, they're trying to come up with a synthetic version, but um, it's just LAL works so well in determining or detecting those little teeny amounts of bacteria or impurities. So it's hard to come up with um, a synthetic version so far. So, but it is in the works and they're important in helping us, um, you know, develop a vaccine against COVID-19. Yep. And the, um, the article that Caitlin mentioned, um, it is, it is um, on the JC Near Facebook page. Um, so you can go on our Facebook page, and I believe I shared it about 
last week, I believe. Um, and you can kind of scroll down. You can find that link. Um, and you can feel free to read that article and check that out. Um, thank you, Caitlin, for mentioning that. It's definitely something that's very important and shows the importance of it right now, especially in um, times like this. All right, well, um, I think we'll wrap things up if there's no other questions. Um, I wanna thank Amy once again for a fantastic presentation. Um, and I wanna thank everybody that joined us today. Um, if you have any other questions, please reach out to us. There is a quick, there should be a quick survey at the end. Um, let us know what you thought of today's creature features. If you have any other suggestions for upcoming creature features to make you know, our, our program, our virtual programs, um, you know, approve over the summer, um, please let us know, um, or anything else, any other ideas that you have uh, in regards to creature features, um, feel free to share. Um, but thanks again, Amy, for a fantastic job, um, great presentation, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you at the, you know, the next one, uh, next creature feature, uh, which is a week from today. And always, you can always keep an eye out on our Facebook page. Um, there will be events for the creature features and any update, um, any upcoming programs that Caitlin has put on. Um, so you can feel free to always keep an eye on that or subscribe to our mailing list. Um, so you'll be always in the know for anything that we've got going on. Absolutely. Thanks, Amy. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining me and talking about horseshoe crabs. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.